This morning, the Lord uh, impressed upon me several things, and I've been praying about it um, for quite a while after this meeting, because it is an honor to be in a pulpit and in a church and in front of each one of you. I want you to know that uh, the message that God's asked me to bring forward this morning is not just if you're a pastor and part of the VLI conference or the Victory Conference or whether or not uh, how old you are, how young you are, how fit you are, how unfit you are, what you do in your day-to-day life. This message is for every one of us. Did you hear that? Every one of us. Every one of us. And it's an equipping message. And I like it when God gives me an equipping message because it means that then it's uh, something you can take with you and something that you can actually apply if you choose to. But I love God because he gives us the, uh, a will. We, we can choose not to apply it. And we can choose to complain and whinge that things aren't working in our life. And then he comes back and keeps reminding us that we have to do something. I don't know if you not understand the word uh, in the scripture that says faith without actions is dead. I don't know if you've ever been around a dead person or a dead animal, but they're dead. Nothing happens. They're dead. And so if you have faith, it doesn't mean anything. It won't do anything. It won't produce anything. It has no life unless it has action to it and deeds to it, something to do with it. So I'm encouraging this morning to do something with what God's going to present. And he wants me to talk about shifting cultures. And it's an interesting thing about cultures. Uh, God has had me many times uh, go into corporations, small and big, and actually go in and shift their cultures. And the reason that they've called me in or paid me money to shift a culture in a company is because the culture that they're at the time is not serving where they want to go or what they want to get as a result. And um, I remember many years ago when God started getting me to do that, most people around said, oh, cultures don't exist. That's just the flavor of the word to you know, do consulting and do that and get paid lots of money. But it's, it's not correct. Culture is very alive. You might not see it, but the Bible as Christians, we're told about the unseen. The cultures are unseen, but they are very, very powerful. I've gone into companies and tried to put something in, like a new philosophy or a new behavior or a new way of doing business, and if the culture is anti that, it never works. No matter how good I am, no matter how good a team I bring, no matter how brilliant God even gives me a word or prophetic for that business, it never works because the culture is so strong. It either supports something that it likes or it repels what it doesn't. And that's, the, that's how God created the world. He created us that way. We, we have an immune system that repels disease. Did you know that? That's powerful. And that's like a culture. We carry cultures, not just physically. We also carry atmospheres. I know none of you are like this, but some people in life, sometimes when you get around them, they're always negative. I know you're not, but have you met people like that? And no matter what you say, and especially if you bring very good strategy to do with the future or to do with change for the better, a lot of people will just find every reason why it won't work and every reason why anything you say will never be supported. And that's because they, they, have, they carry their own culture. And four things come out of cultures. One is attitudes. The other one is behaviors. So attitudes, behaviors. Communication comes out of cultures. And the last thing is perspective. And perspectives are very powerful too. As Christians, we'd probably say that that's the first step to a belief. And they're very strong as well. So this morning, I want to share about how to change cultures. But how we actually change cultures is, as Christians is it's us. We're told throughout the word that it is uh, us that changes things. I think that we're moved into a new season. And I've been, I've been on this for a few years, but I believe we're being moved into a new season that instead of begging God for things, we're being told to go after them. We were never told to beg. Because as soon as we beg, that shows that we've come from a culture that doesn't believe that God will do it and doesn't believe what God said would happen through us. So even if that needs to be shifted this morning. Now, Chris, do you still have pain in your knee? Yeah, Chris. You're called Chris, aren't you? Sorry? Ray. He ta- oh, no. Ray, do you have a pain in your knee right now? Can you come here, please? Quickly, please. You see, I, I, the anointing could disappear. And I know we laugh at that, but I know as Christians that carry that culture, they think that only certain people have the anointing, and they believe that only sometimes the anointing is there and sometimes it's not. I believe that if we know the word, we can carry the anointing at all times. 
it might have different levels, so I understand that. And I got challenged with that a couple of years ago by a, a mentor of mine where uh, he was saying, do you, when I pray for people with healing meetings, when I have them, he said, do you, at the end, when people come up to you that should have come up in the anointing but come up later, do you pray for them? I go, no, I don't, because they should have been there in the anointing to get it. And I had the right philosophy behind that, that it's not me, it's God, and it's the anointing. And then he said, well, then you need to stretch yourself to another limit because you should be carrying the anointing at all times. Jesus, our Lord, carried the anointing at all times to the point that people would touch him or touch the hem of his garment and he knew that that anointing had leaked. So he didn't just go to a prayer meeting and get it. He carried it all the time. Which name? That one. I heard that. Someone said, if you're prophetic, you should have known. <laughs> I heard that. So there's pain in it right now? Yeah, it's pain all the time. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, by your anointing, we command the tendons and the kneecap. Thank you, Father. Line up. All right, now move it around a little bit and tell me if anything's changed. If you have to bend on it slightly, just don't stress it, though. What's happened? It's gone. It actually has. He's dumbfounded. No, I'm not. <laughs> no, I expected it. You expected it. I got it last year, but did. Yeah, your, your shoulder got healed last yeah. year. Yeah. All right, now, let's give God a hand. <laughs> God did that. Now... Are you, are you tough enough to handle what I want to say? Do I have permission to be tough on you? <laughs> you can say no. You've got to say yes, don't I? No, you know, you can say no. I will just say yes. All right. I'm going to say this to all of you. He should not have had to come to me. We need to move into a new season that we don't run after someone that we think is anointed. And I'm not saying it's wrong of him. But last year, I prayed for his shoulder, and he came up this year, and he said, it's still healed. I still have complete healing. And he said, so can you pray for my knee this year? And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but I think we need to start changing that culture. Because any one of us has the access to the same anointing. And so I'm, I'm not rebuking you. I'm going to encourage you that the next time the enemy brings any sickness on you, because you've been healed of that last year, this, this year, if he tries another thing on you, you need to stand and say, I'm not waiting for another year for Alan to pray for me. I'm going to stand in the authority that I've been given now. Amen. And I'm going to stand and receive Amen. that. And then you keep doing it until it comes. It's called stirring up the gift. You can sit down. I'll put it into practice. Thank you. Amen. Give him a hand. Thank you, Lord. So, I, I want to talk a little bit about culture. I gathered through that, you're hearing me? Because I, I can't hear me at all. But when I first went into companies to change a culture, companies have many different types of departments, different sizes. <coughs> Sorry, you didn't actually need to turn that up. It's just Different departments, different sizes. I would come in with the new philosophy or the principles and I bring principles of God because I know that they work in business. And what would happen is in the beginning, I'd bring those principles in and they tended to, as I said before, get repelled. It wouldn't last. Or everyone would have a buzz for a little while and then it would go back to the same way it was before. So I went to the Lord because I felt that that was my ministry is helping people wherever I am, church or in business or out in just the marketplace talking to people. I thought, what's wrong? What do I need to do? And he showed me what Jesus did. Jesus did not spend three years to get to the cross. Jesus spent three years showing 12 people and discipling them so that then they would continue to disciple others and disciple others and disciple others, and that's why we're here today, 2,000 years later. And he showed me that Jesus didn't just teach these men. He would then get these men who had this culture inside of them, and he would send them into strategic places. And he would allow their salt and their light to affect that place. So I said, okay, Lord, I'll try that out. So I would find in a company four, five, 12 key people who believed in what I believed in, that I wanted to bring into the company. And the best people that I could find were the ones that whinged the loudest. Because they whinged because they didn't like the climate. They didn't like the way they were talked to. They didn't like the way they were treated. Most people ignore those people and think they're negative. They're not. They're actually very passionate. 
They're just re not directed right yet. So I would get them and I would encourage them and get them on my team and I would feed into them and I would send them into different departments to spread. The thing was, they always were in those departments. But now that I was encouraging them about what they believe, I was supporting and equipping them and teaching them of how to spread that in that department. All of a sudden, they became some of the best coaches, mentors, but they became my best disciples. And they started to change the culture. Because up until then, they thought, because the culture repelled what they, the way they were, they thought it was impossible. And then they blamed and put excuses against the company, the bosses, and everything else. When I came along and encouraged them and supported them and spoke vision into them, what could happen, and spoke the future, they then went and did it. And then companies would change. And you're not allowed to share that with anyone because they probably won't pay me as much money anymore. But it's about culture changes. Now, I want to show you a little bit about how a culture changes. This nation and every other nation that's represented in this room needs to be shifted. It needs to be shifted to a Christ-like nation. We all know that, we speak it, we jump up and down, but the reason it's not happening is because we're waiting for someone else to do it or we're waiting for God to do it or we're begging him to do it. We might need to, first of all, change the culture in us to believe that he can do it. And I was part of that. And it wasn't until recently when God opened a door in a Central American co um, country and I went in there, and I'm not really generally... I wouldn't regard myself as a missionary, though I've done a lot of mission trips over the years. And the thing was is that I went in there thinking I was going to talk to pastors and equipping and meeting people and going to orphanages and doing that sort of thing. Within about two weeks before I arrived there, a few people had heard that I, I work in business and God opened some doors up so that I was still doing the orphanage and mission work, but he started putting me in front of people that were influential in business because they were passionate about wanting to change the culture of their nation but they'd never heard anyone ever speak that maybe they could be part of it because all they were doing was praying for the church leaders to do it or for God to do it. And so I came in and started to... I, my, the meetings doubled because now I was having private meetings with millionaires. I had private meetings with the mayor of the city and then they invited me back just recently again to meet with one of the presidential candidates and pray for him and, and prophesy for him and everything. And I've got to tell you, I felt so humble because I don't have that knowledge but what happened is that the first key was that someone called me that carries a culture that believes this came into an environment that within a couple of weeks soaked somehow and the word spread so that people triggered to that culture I was standing in. And these key people started to pop up. When I left that nation, the Lord said, in my word it says disciple nations, it doesn't say disciple people. Now I'm not saying you shouldn't disciple people. But he showed me and said disciple nations. And he said, and you've never believed it could be done until now. And I said, that's right, I now believe it can and I, I can see what you, you mean. So I, I'm not saying I have the strategy, but I believe it now. My culture is starting to shift. That I actually believe that God wants nations shifted. I actually believe he's raising up people all around the world to start standing in this. I believe that victory is a key point of it. I do. It's a key. A lot of people kind of look at victory and think, oh, yeah, 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 it's kind of out there. But that's because they're tainted by the culture. We have to turn around and understand who we are. Uh, I was watching the um, Q&A with Pastor Margaret on the TV the other night, and of course, you know, we were there to just listen to Jim Wallace and hear what he had to say, and of course, the culture of today was attacking him of making a stand as a Christian about homosexuals. He didn't even start the fight. They did, in that sense. A fight didn't really happen, but it's just like they, they were picking at it, because that's the culture. Not just that the culture wants to accept gays, but it's the fact that the culture is in a bit of an intimidating, and you were talking about that as an intimidating spirit yesterday morning over with the VLI pastors. But as we were sitting there watching it, I noticed something. I noticed that our culture in this nation, I'm sure in other nations, has done another shift, a greater shift. And that was that they're not just trying to get gay marriages and doing all this sort of stuff, but there was a woman that was on that show who was on the panel who stood there or sat there and claimed as a Christian and talked about the grace of Jesus and the love of Jesus, which is fantastic, but then, in her own words, talked about the acceptance of gays and the homosexuals. In other words, it was like the Lord, I felt the Lord ringing my ears going, see, I told you, it's changing. That's why we have to enlist an army to start getting it changed back. Now, we can pray, we can argue, we can get upset, and we can get in little, little whingy parties and complain about these people. That's not what God wants us to do. Jesus didn't sit in a corner and pray. He went out. 
He went into the culture of the day and brought his culture. So let me show you a little bit about shifting cultures. I, um, because I've worked in that area uh, over the last, let's say, 25, 30 years, I've done a lot of study on it. And um, I want to, I, I did years of study on cultures, which I'll share a little bit about. But God showed me this one key of how to shift a culture in that sense. But then he showed me this very key thing that I think as the body of Christ we need to understand to a greater level. In Luke chapter 10, because it talks about this, it says, after these things, in verse 1, the Lord appointed 70 others. I love that. He didn't say my 12 apostles. He didn't say my 12 anointed ones. He just grabbed 70 that were probably close to him. So we can't say that it was only the anointing that was on specific people. He grabbed 70 others. Luke chapter 10, verse 1. 70 others. And he sent them. Now, here's some points. If you love points, I'm going to throw them in now. Number one, he sent them. He sent them. Now, he had to send them from somewhere. He sent them from him. He was the church. It's like this. This is the local church. A local church has to understand how to send. Both are necessary. Both are necessary. A local church and equipping and sending. So, he sent them. Two by two. I love that. They go out in a team. They go out in support. Before his face into every city. That's point number two. Every city. Is it every, it's not just some, or the ones you like. Every city, just go. Place where he himself was about to go. And then he said to them, The harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And I'm praying that, that you, you're the laborers, we're the laborers, we're out there in the harvest, that's the field. And then it says, Go your way, behold, I send you out as lambs amongst wolves. That's point number three. Don't wait until it feels great and everyone's going to love you. Light is not light until it's in darkness. You understand that? I love the light of God. I love that the light is, this room is full with the light of God that lives within us. But it can do nothing in here. But when we take this light into darkness, then it has an effect. But if we keep trying to, in a culture, hide in our light, all we get is a light party or a little party of it. We need to go out to do something to change the culture. And if you don't believe that, that might be the first thing you need to start stirring up in yourself, that you carry the light of God. Stir it up to know that it shifts atmosphere wherever you walk. When you go into the darkness, even if you do not see it, something's happening. Do not believe anymore. Shift that inside of you. And if you don't believe it, fake it till you make it. Turn up at your workplace. Turn up at the shop where you have lunch today. Go wherever you are and just believe. Fake it. Go, my light inside of me from the Lord Jesus Christ is shifting this whole atmosphere. And you start to see what happens when, even when you're faking it, but you're declaring it inside of yourself, something shifts. Lambs amongst wolves. But you notice that that could be scary to some people. That's another part of the Christian culture that needs to shift. Stop being scared. Our Lord is the Lord that is taken all authority, not just in heaven, but on earth. And you have it. You have access to it. The devil has bluffed us. Let's shift that. Shift it. How do you shift it? By doing something. Not by sitting in your lounge room praying all day. Praise great, but get out and do something with it. We need to shift and understand that. I'm not afraid of the devil. I'm sorry, I'm not. Because I don't want to believe a lie. And fear is not from my God. Fear is not part of his kingdom. It's just not. So, All right, verse 4. Carry, I love this part. Carry neither money, knapsack, nor sandals, and greet no one along the road. That might not go down too well in too many evangelistic books today. Don't greet anyone along the road. And I looked at that and thought, hang on, I've never seen that before. Greet no one? That's a bit rude, Lord. Greet no one? But see, he had a strategy. That's the other point. To shift cultures, you have to have a strategy. To take nations and cities, you have to have a strategy. As well with the other stuff. So, but whatever, I love this, but whatever house you enter, in verse 5, first say, peace to this house. Do you know what that is? That's declaration. That's, not, that's the next point. I don't even know what I'm up to. Five, four, six. But that's the next one. Declare. They declare peace. It doesn't mean, oh, have it, you know, have a happy time. That word is incredible what it means. Declare it over every house, not just the ones that like you. As in the first stage. Declare it. And it says, and if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. Too many people in our culture of Christianity wait until people accept us, then we give them. Jesus wants it the other way around. Give it, and if they accept it, great. If they don't, great. Our job's not about that. Our job's just to give it and declare it and declare it and declare it. 
this world and this nation and all the nations need peace and everything that comes with it. And you're the ones that are meant to carry it. Next point. I love this. This is what rocked my world. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the labourers worth his wages. And this is part. Do not go from house to house. I thought, Lord, that's pretty limiting, Lord. Remain. Why? Why remain? Why stay in one house? Why not talk to people along the road till they get there? Relationship. Relationship. He wanted them to stay. No matter what the culture of that house was, he wanted them to declare peace, walk into that declaration with the light and stand there and stay there and shift the culture of that house. Do you understand that? Shift it. Now, why relationship? I've learned this over the last couple of years. Wherever my wife, and Annie, and I are, and she gives her love, by the way, wherever we are, not just in a church, not just around nice Christian people like yourself, wherever we are in our life, if I'm filling up fuel in my car, if I'm buying something in a grocery shop, wherever I live and I'm breathing, wherever we are, we want to build relationship. People think, oh, but you can't. You can. Shift the culture. Build relationship. Why? Because relationship builds trust. That's why. God didn't want, and Jesus didn't want, just a whole bunch of people running around talking about the kingdom of God. He wanted them to be disciples. He wanted nations to be disciples. Discipleship is different than just hearing a word or hearing knowledge or hearing a religion or a belief system. Relationship. I'll give you an example. Um, some of you know this, but we were in Canada for a year. We're not now, but we were in Canada for a year and we were looking after our son. But Annie and I like coffee and it's hard to find good coffee in North America. And if you're American, I, I love you. And I'm a Canadian birth as well, so but shocking coffee. So when you find a good coffee shop, but anyway, so we, we would often go to a lot of coffee shops thinking we were going for good coffee. Lord had a different reason. Um, what would happen is that there'd be a lot of staff there. So I learned, I'm going to show you these, a few of these practical tools. They're very simple. But I learned how to say hello and talk and then go back a few days later and go back to a few days later and build, in other words, remain in the house and build a relationship and carry that atmosphere you carry. In this one coffee shop, the result of that was that one of the girls started to talk to Annie and Annie has an anointing on that to talk in that sense I'm talking about. <laughs> And I was, you didn't wait till I finished. <laughs> An anointing to talk in the areas of just how God has affected her life, but in a very natural way. And we were just talking and befriending them. We never talked about God, though. We were just talking, she's talking, I'm talking. Within a matter of weeks, one of these girls came up and said, we don't know what it is about you two, but we look forward to the two of you walking in our door. That has nothing to do with our personality. It has nothing to do with the anointing. It has to do with God living in each one of us and building a relationship. And I should, and you should, I'm going to put some shoulds here, that if we are citizens of heaven, which it says we are, we should be behaving like those citizens. I've told this story before, but uh, for those that haven't heard it, and if you have, you're going to hear it again. When Annie and I were visiting a resort place called Lake Louise in Canada, we, it's, there's like a walk around the lake. And it's probably a half an hour, three, three quarters of an hour walk. When we were walking back, looking back towards the hotel on the side of the lake, there was about two or 300 tourists there, all taking photos. And there's this guy, which we can see in the distance, in the lake. Now, this lake is half frozen sometimes and sometimes totally frozen. But he, this is half frozen. So there's big ice chunks. Every, this guy is in the water with a big iceberg in his hand. And he's talking away and loud. We were miles away, but when we looked... We looked at each other and went, I bet you he's an Aussie. <laughs> and sure enough, when we walked all the way around, he was. And everyone's taking pictures and he, see, he was behaving like a citizen of Australia. <laughs> he was. And we recognized it. And the more I travel, the more I realized that you can, that people carry a culture of their nation. They speak like it. Remember what I said? They speak like it. They behave like it. They have perspectives like it. The, nation, the culture of this nation has great things, but also other things that need to change. The same as 
We all know. We need to be more Christ-like. One thing of this nation that I continue to declare is that it will become a nation of encouragers, not pulling down people. It will, because that's Christ-like. And if we declare it and continue to do it, so what I do is I build relationships. I remain in the house now. We remained in that coffee shop. And the result after 11 months is not only that the majority of all the staff, this is the result, there's a lot in between, were saved, healed, even to the point the cook, they rang me up and said, well, oh, could you talk to the cook? And I said, you want me to talk? I don't know how to cook. And they said, no, 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 be a father to him. I went, where are they getting this? I hadn't even spoken that sort of language. But they're receiving a culture that we carry. And I have this 7, 18-year-old boy, no, 19-year-old boy sitting in front of me telling me this story. So I said, yeah, I'll have coffee with him. Telling me this story that reminded me of my childhood. But here he is, and he's got a, he's got a partner. He's got an 18-month-year-old kid. The partner's left, taking the kid. I mean, he's a mess. He's cutting himself. Everything's going on. And he's telling me why relationship, but relationship with the others. And it built trust. They knew there was something different about us because we carried hope. We carried love. We carried grace. The culture of heaven. That'd be a good title for this. The culture of heaven. How to carry that. And then, not only are we, like he and I, like best friends, we led, I led him to the Lord. Not then. I built a relationship with him. And my son now, who had gone through similar stuff, been totally healed, is now, I found, got a text last night, he's now taking this guy out, going to the movies, taking him to church, doing everything else. See, that's the culture shift. Now, if thousands and thousands and thousands of people in the churches in every nation understood that, come here, get equipped, carry it out, we actually can change nations. We actually can. We can. I'm glad there was about 10 that got excited about that. I just need to get two more by the end of the meeting and I'll be like Jesus. That's all I want. It's 12. It's all we need. The next verses are this. Whatever city you enter, now he's shifted it up to cities. Whatever, in verse 8, whatever city you enter, and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. And then he goes, and heal the sick, say, and, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. That's pretty awesome. Because now God's being declared, not the new age, not Buddhism, not, not anything else has been there. And the, what I wanted to show you about cultures and, and repelling is that they are so powerful, but we need to shift it back. The culture at the moment, if we were looking at that as all the different provinces or different things in each nation that's represented here. There's a lot of culture in there that needs to be shifted. But we can stay and pray and pray and that's good. We need to keep doing it. We need to do everything else. But we need to go from house to house, not from house to house. We need to get around people in our community. And you might go, even those that have churches, you might go, oh, I've only 20 people. We've got a lot more than Jesus had. Seriously. Where's the, change your culture. Understand that just those 20 could actually change a city of 100,000 like that if you build relationships if you understand what you're carrying, if you understand that you're shifting culture. And we need to do it. Now, some people go, oh, but there's only a few of us, as I just mentioned. Well, I, I'm going to give you some statistics here. And I'm going to use the homosexual gay uh, platform here. I, I'm not afraid. I don't know why people say, oh, you shouldn't talk about it. Why not? He did. I'm not against them. I love them. I'm serious. I love homosexuals. Put that on the news. <laughs> I said it with a deep voice, though. I was good. I do love them. Because you know that when they're in heaven, they're not male or female. I don't know if you knew that. And I want them in heaven. So does God. Because he created them. The devil plays around with stuff that is not important at all. That our sex is not important. What they're doing is not important. It's their soul. It's their soul. And if we can love, it'll break down every barrier, every condition they have. We just need to love them. This, this nation, I remember growing up here. I came here as a kid. My parents brought me here. It wasn't my fault. I love Australia. It's home. But it's funny. Now in my life, I feel like every nation I put my feet down becomes home. It's just the way God is but with me at the moment. But anyway, I remember, and I've written down some statistics here, but I written down, down the 70s. How many of you lived in the 70s? They were the, I love disco. Anyway. My kids, though, this is bad. My kids are in their 20s, late 20s. Some of them are married. They've found a picture. My youngest daughter found a picture of me, seriously, in grey velvet flare suit. <laughs> the, full, the full big, oh, long hair. 
That one of those songs that was being played here um, yesterday, we were kind of like, oh, it's like the old rocker days. So I don't know, what was that song? Anyone with the hair flowing? Anyway. Beg your pardon? Oh, was that the song, was it? Yeah. Just, anyway, so those of us in the 70s, this is the way. I want to show you how powerful we can change the culture of this nation and every other nation. You need to hear this. Not just with your eyes. That's weird. <laughs> but you have to hear with your spiritual heart, spiritual eyes, spiritual ears. You have to hear this. You have to see it. In the 70s, in fact, it was 1972 that South Australia passed the first decriminalization of certain homosexual acts. That's where it started. But the culture, I want you to understand this, in the 70s, the culture with homosexuals were three things. It was wrong, it was disgusting, and it was abnormal. That was the culture. And the culture supported that because when they wanted to do the Mardi Gras in Sydney, so many people, not against it as in just the Christians against it, I'm talking about the normal public did not want that being displayed in their city. Culture repels or supports what it has. Our culture back then repelled that. But then they continued to be strategic. This is a minority group. That's how I'm using this as an example. A very small minority group continued to be strategic and continued to influence government, businesses, the arts, media. Now I'm showing you the spheres of the cultures we live in. They went into influence with a strategy. Influence, influence, influence. How? There weren't many of them. You need to understand that. There weren't many of them. A minority. But they understood, and the devil knows this plan, they understood that if they go to places and saturate their culture into that culture, with that culture not being aware, they can shift and change. Do you know they're still a minority? Let me give you the statistics. So that was in 1972. 25 years ago, because that 1972 is almost 40 years ago. 25 years ago, the culture then just thought of it as being strange or weird, but not wrong. It was already changing. Nationally, it was already changing. In the media, in the way people talk, culture was changing towards homosexuals. We're talking about millions of people changing with only a small few people. 15 years ago, the culture changed to the point, as a nation, in this nation, it became tolerated. It was now all about tolerance. We should tolerate it. Christians were attacked at that point because we, weren't, we were regarded as not tolerating, which was our fault because really we, are, we should be loving them and be known that we're loving them because that's what our religion faith does. No other faith does that. It was 15 years ago. It was tolerated. The culture also went into being catering for it. You might not know that, but if you study history, we started catering as a nation towards it to do with our laws, to do with other things that were happening. And people started to experiment with it. 15 years ago. That's the culture. It's changing. Now, it's normal, it's accepted, and the last word, and this is what we're going to start seeing even more of, it's being celebrated. That's the way cultures change. You need to not worry about that. You need to get excited about that because that's a minority changing a nation in 40 years. God put in my heart two years ago as a nation changer that in my heart, my goal now has nothing to do with me anymore. It has nothing to do with the ministry. It has nothing to do with anything. I want to raise up, and it was Cindy said this over me on Sunday night a little bit, I want to raise up a gen new generation of revivalists all through the world so that they are better than me. As a true father, I want people to do better than I can. That's what a true father is. I'm not a brother and I want to compete. I want to father people. And I have a hundred-year goal. And people are going, yes, but we'll be raptured before then. Great. You sit there and hide and think that you're a, a weak church and waiting to be rescued by a ship with Jesus. I think that's fantastic, and I believe in the rapture. But I'm not going to live that way. I'm going to live knowing that I'm already a citizen of heaven now. And I'm going to take as many as I can on that ship with me. If you want to put it that way. I want as many people going up in the clouds, if that's what's going to happen, with me. I want people in heaven. I don't want them eternally in hell. I'm not going to win them over by an argument. I've won a lot of people in the kingdom by arguments, and then someone's come along and argued them out of the kingdom. I want to disciple through shifting culture and then shifting it in them so they then go and shift others. They don't change. 
Here's the statistics about this. And by the way, the Mardi Gras, after how many ever the years now, is now, and I heard it last year on the news, it is now a family event. Naked people walking through the street, I don't care who they are and what their sexual preference is, that Mardi Gras is now a family event. See how culture changes? Was it millions of people? No, let me give you the statistics. In Australia now, now, not even back then, now, 1.6% of men are homosexual. 1.6%, that's it. 0.8% of women. And then they say there's about 1% that will say they're bisexual. We're talking about two, maybe, maybe two to two and a half percent. Now, what have we missed? We've missed and listened to the belief of the enemy that it takes a lot of people to change something. God's kingdom started the opposite. He sent one son. He trained 12, and then he sent 50, and he sent 70 or 72. It's not a majority. It's a minority. We, we are in the best time on earth right now to change the culture. You know why? Because I'm going to tell you the truth. There's a Christian belief system in most nations. We're minorities now. We might say we're a Christian nation, and I declare that we will be a Christian nation again. But as far as the belief system of the good, living God and who we are, we actually now are a minority, and that excites me because that's a challenge. But really, according to statistics, it should be easy because we just have to be that minority and so can do what they did. We have to do what God said. We have to influence. We have to move. So the minority can influence. If you like 10 points, here's some here's very, very, very complicated 10 points. So you really have to listen. And the heading of these 10 points is we are the light and the salt of the earth. Did you hear that? We're the light and the salt of the church? No, we're the light and salt of the earth, the world and the earth. We are the church. We're the body of Christ. And we come to church to have community and love and equipping and, and understanding more and more about what we need to do. But as a minority, we can do that. This is anywhere you are. This was where I started. Now, point number one, smile. I'm serious. I had to learn how to smile to people, especially the ones I didn't like. I wasn't rude to people. I, haven't, I don't tend to do that when I became a Christian. God, God created me differently, and I've stirred that gift up. But I didn't tend to smile. And so Annie's been helping me. How did you smile to a stranger? And then I, and th that's the first thing I learned. That's all you have to do is just learn how to smile. You'd be surprised at what an anointing can do on a smile because the anointing can create the whole universe. Imagine what it can do on a smile. I'm serious. I'm not joking. The second point that I, this is the next level though. You really have to practice the smiling a lot. The next graduation level he showed me to was saying hi, hello. Actually saying hello. And then understanding that even on the word hello, there's an anointing on it. And I'm in a culture that doesn't talk to each other. I'm in a culture and, a, and nations that are scared and fearful of each other. And so I would just say hello. And it's not my hello. It's not my face. It's the fact that there's an anointing on what I carry as the light and salt. And so I, that's what I graduated. And I'm serious. I would do this for months. Don't be silly. Take time. Some of you want to jump to point 10. I want you, seriously, and I believe God does this too. And I believe this is prophetic right now. I can, I can sense it in my spirit. Some of you need to know how powerful God really is that he can work just from a smile and just saying hello. I'm actually picking up that some of you are going to be so blown away that if you discipline yourself for the next three months to only do that. Now, I'm not saying you know, if the officer asks you a question and you just, no. <laughs> or just keep going, hello. 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 No. <laughs> but discipline yourself. I have to say that. I've, I've, I've come across the spirit of stupidity a lot. <laughs> I have. Even in myself sometimes. But you, some, I really pick it up. Some of you actually need to discipline yourself for, say, three months. That that's going to be your evangelism. Because God's going to rock your world and show you how powerful he is on just the obedience of putting that into practice. And, and all sorts of things will open up. I love it. 
I love the stuff that opens up. And it's called relationship. The third point, once you've graduated from that, ask them how they are. Sorry, I it's not advanced science here. I noticed Jesus did a lot of this. Smiled, said hello, asked them how they are. You'd be surprised at how many people in a culture of a sickness culture and a dying culture, when you ask them how they are, under the anointing, will actually answer you. I was shocked because most of my life before I learned this revelation, I'd ask people how they were, I'm fine. But when I started asking in the anointing intentionally, how are you? I wish I hadn't at first. <laughs> Man, it's like, oh, oh, <laughs> really? Okay, oh, oh okay. <laughs> and they're going to tell you everything about the pain and everything about the story. And then I went, Lord, and he said, that's okay. Because guess what? You're understanding what they carry. That's what they're carrying, that oppression. So then, once I did that, and by the way, when you do that, you can move into any of these next six categories. <laughs> depending on the, uh, and this is it, it's not depending on the anointing. It's depending on God and the Holy Spirit. Yes, we pray. Yes, there's times of fasting. Yes, there's times of soaking. Yes, there's times of getting in his presence. I understand that. And there's levels. I understand we contend and stir that up. I mean, I have such a heart for seeing the dead raised. I have such a heart for people that are, that are what people regard as the impossible healings out of wheelchairs and stuff like that. I have a heart for that. I have a heart to see limbs grow back. I have a heart for that because I know God will do it. I know he wants to do it. And I know that if it's going to take me the next 30 or 40 years of me contending for it, but I don't get it, I'll just be like Abram and I'll let my kids get it. Start from there. But someone's going to run it. And I have a hunger for it. So I know that God's going to develop that if I develop it and do stuff. But I'm not going to, you know, it's like, I'm not going to go to someone in the shopping mall and pray for the wheelchair and go, it didn't work. I might smile first. I've learned how to do that. <laughs> and how are you? But there could be opportunities to offer prayer if they say a lot. But here's the fourth thing. Listen. <laughs> Just listen to people. You'd be amazed at the simple things. These are the things that would have happened with those disciples that stayed in a house. They would have had to listen, smile, say thank you. And yet people were healed. Miraculous things showed up. God showed up. He's a God of relationship. The fifth one, become interested in their world as you see them again. Or talk to them. Ask them about their world. Ask them how they're doing. What's happening? But show interest, even if it seems painful. Show interest. That's what love is. That's what grace is. The sixth point, give a word of encouragement. This is where it's fun. You do not have to run up to people and say, thus saith the Lordeth and blah, 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 blah. Just give a word of encouragement. Annie found it difficult to prophesy. Had always found it because she'd grown up in a culture where you kind of don't do that unless it's that man or that woman and that would be it. And the culture supported that. A Christian... Culture supported that. So people would flock to that man or to that woman. So she didn't even stir up that gift. And so to start off, rather than thinking, how will I say thus is the Lord and if I fail and I do this, she decided to, she decided to start at this level where she simply would just go up to people and she would say, you know, and it, and she didn't wait for an unction, you know. She just would maybe feel something in her heart towards someone that looked depressed or, and, and look, if someone's depressed, you don't have to be discerning. I'm serious. Or if someone's, you know, looking sad or whatever, God will show you. But she then just goes up to them and says, is it okay if I just give you a word of encouragement? That's all she says. She's never had one refusal. And she's probably gone, and she wouldn't like me saying this, but probably about two to 3,000 people in the last three years. Just wherever she is. They are out there. I just thought I'd let you know. People are just out there. You, if you actually count everyone that you see when you walk through one day, you'd be surprised. But it's not that you run after them all and tackle them all. Just smile. Start on that one, remember? But give a word of encouragement. And I listen to her now, and she is so prophetic. And she's starting to understand that. We all can access it. She's not holding the office of the prophet. She's just prophetic, using the gift. And God's giving it more and more because he's trusting that she'll just want to encourage someone. And people weep on bus stops. People are crying. People, people get healed. Just want a little word of encouragement. Sometimes, and, and I, I can't do this side of it because she has an advantage of being a woman, where she'll go up to another woman and say, I think your hair just looks great today. 
And all of a sudden, boom. Before she knows it, this has happened, that's happened, they're talking, she's prayed for her and the lady's healed of cancer. Come on. And she's talking about her hairdo. I know there's some really expensive hairdressers out there that have a good anointing on them. But do you understand what, how God just opens the door? Just culturally, we start to shift it. Cult, we are the culture shifters. We bring the culture of heaven and we shift it in there. Now, that was point six, wasn't it? Point seven, build a relationship. Start to build one. Again, it's point seven. It's not point one. You don't run out to people and say, hi, hi, I'd like to have a relationship with you. Smile first. <laughs> Say hi. And then allow yourself to build a relationship. I have so many spiritual sons and daughters around the world now. And I, it's not my nature. But I'm learning how to smile. And then say hi. And then before I know it, they're hanging around, talking to me. I had one the other day just come in the coffee shop and sat down. I've like said hello to him at the counter twice. And he sits down in front of me. I'm like, huh? And I find out he doesn't, he's never had a dad and he just really likes it when I walk in. And he, you know, I said one encouraging word to him or something. It was simple like, you know, I just think you're great. You're doing a good job. Do you know the best time that that works when you say you're doing a good job is when they're not. I'm serious. That's the best kingdom principle you could ever learn. Jesus heal, uh, saved me when I didn't deserve it. When I was a bad boy. <laughs> He gave it to me. If I, can, if I see someone and I go, arr, arr, that's not going to be encouraging. It's not bringing the kingdom. It's bringing, I'm not saying that you're demonic if you're bringing correction. I understand there's correction and accountability and discipline. But discipline should have honor. Discipline, confrontation is good if it has honor and love. It's not about the person. It's about the thing and you correct and you discipline. But it's by love and honor. So build a relationship with people and you'll be surprised at what happens. Um, the other thing is become a friend, point eight. Hopefully some of you can get to that point. Become a friend. <laughs> I know these are deep things. But that's the culture. We've lived in this culture where we have to be so wise to do an effect for God. We have to be so anointed to do effect for God. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Do you understand that? There is an enemy and there is a hell and he doesn't want anyone living upstairs. He wants them down with him. Do you understand that hell was not built for us? I don't know if you've studied hell but, and everything that God's talked about. There's like over 250 references in some way to hell. It's not a bad place. It was a place that God built to protect us. I don't know if you know that. God is so good that even when we fell into sin and sin existed in our nature, he was so good to us, he had to throw us out of the garden so we wouldn't have access to eternal life in sin. I don't know if you understand how good our God is. Don't take the culture twist on it that man puts. Never bring God down to our theology. Huh. Look how good he is. He didn't build hell for us or for sinners. He built it for the demons and devil. So the devil wants company. I just thought I'd let you know that. He, he still is a created being by God. He might have fallen, but he's still. And, and guess what? I don't know if this is a revelation for you, but the devil is not equal with God. Our culture sees him equal with God. You've got to be kidding. He, he's not even equal with Jesus. He is an angel, fallen and taken care of. So he's done. All right, the ninth thing. You'll find this happening, and this might happen earlier. I said you could jump to this point once you've, you know, asked them what's wrong with them. Um, you can offer prayer. Ooh. That's why it's point nine. You can offer prayer, and prayer doesn't have to be something spiritual in the sense of the way we think of spiritual. Prayer can just be, be blessed. Prayer could just be, be healed. We've built a culture that has to be this profound, long, long prayer, and God's been breaking that out of me. I like what was being said about worship. I truly believe that. And I'm, not, I'm a worshiper in my heart, but I don't play instruments and I don't sing in that sense, to, to bring the anointing. I think sometimes it should leave if I think it's too much. No, I'm only joking. Um, but, but for me, as a worshipper, I believe we're moving, and we're seeing it across the world now, and we have to get on board of this. Worship is moving to a new season as well. It's moving to a season of shifting cultures. 
I've seen it in places where simply the worship has moved beyond the first step, which is entertainment, which doesn't happen here, but it can in some churches. It's moved beyond then bringing people into the throne room and it's gone even to another higher level. And that higher level is that it's actually shifting the demonic culture that's sitting on people in disease, depression, this, that, and things and healings are being popped. Why? Because the worship's moved to that next level. I think that it can even go higher to another level. And I'm declaring that where atmospheres will be shifted in cities because of worship. That's why I loved what Cindy said last night. And I, I remember then, I remember studying that, that they used to send the worshipers ahead. It's because the anointing breaks the yokes. So it's moving to that. So I, I prophesy over this house that the new songs won't be songs. I, they'll, be, they'll be notes from heaven. There you go. They'll be notes from heaven. I prophesy even that in times when the worship's going and those moments have been hit, you're actually going to hear heaven. You are. You're going to hear music from heaven. You're going to hear angels sing. I'm declaring that over this house because that's what's going to start. Right now, that's just the local church. And the reason that happens is that you then carry that belief system, that experience, and then you go out into your world and you understand that you can shift the same atmosphere because it's the same anointing and the same Lord, and you can do that. So offer prayer. Nothing wrong with offering prayer. And if you think it doesn't work, it doesn't matter. It's not about working. It's about being obedient and bringing the kingdom. Jesus didn't say, will it work when it work? And if it doesn't do this and justify this and explain this theology, and if it didn't work straight away, decide that you can declare and you can do He didn't bring down all this theology in case it didn't work. He knew it worked and just left it at that. Sometimes he added a little bit of teaching to certain things like prayer and fasting and other stuff to get certain demons out. But basically, we're to just do it. I reckon when we get to heaven, we're going to see some replays on DVDs and go, wow, you mean that that anointing switched through that person even though nothing happened on the spot? It happened and they went home and this happened, that happened, that happened? Yeah. We don't, it's the unseen. We're to have faith in that God's doing that. So just do it. And I know it. I know every time I pray for something, something's happened. I don't ever feel it all the time, but I know it because I know that's my God and he said it'll happen. So then the last point, point 10, is then offer them Jesus. You hear what I said? Offer. You can't save anyone. <laughs> Jesus does that. Holy Spirit does that, not us. Offer him. I'm surprised at how many people, once I've built a relationship, they know me, they trust me, there's been a, a few anointing, they understand I'm not after them, they understand that I care about them, and then when I offer Jesus in the right moment, I don't just walk up and offer it. There might be a moment that they need someone, and, and it, it could be that they don't have a father and they haven't, and so I talk about Jesus being a father. It might be that they... Never had anyone love them, might be the rejection. Who knows what it is? It could simply be, would you like to have Jesus in your life so that any time you get sick, you can pray for yourself? You, you give an encouragement about how good Jesus is in certain things as a tool, then you watch people accept him. Offer him. So remember minorities' influence. And that you're the light and the salt. There's, there's a, I just have to share this other, this one because. As I said before, you're a citizen of heaven. And as a citizen of heaven, and we've talked about that before, what do citizens behave like? But the other thing is that as citizens of heaven, there's a new culture, not an old. And if we're not aware of it, you need to read it. There was an old culture, and that culture is where the people of God carried judgment. God did too. Carried judgment, carried wrath. But there's a new culture. And it's been around for 2,000 years, but it's a new culture. And this is the one we're meant to carry. So a part of you, inside of you, have occasionally carried a bit of the old culture, you need to shift it. If you've carried the old culture of judgment, and if you have an opinion, be careful, because that's like my, most of the time it's the root is a judgment, an opinion on something. I'm called on that by God all the time. When I give it a strong opinion on something, and he then rebukes me later and says, yeah, but what's the root of that? Why were you so strong against that. What's the root? Where's the grace? Where's the love? And that's the new culture. The new culture that came in 2,000 years ago that we are followers of is grace, love, and power. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon someone and then they would do mighty works, but it came from God. The new culture is that Jesus said that, we, that the Spirit will be upon all flesh, that we have him living in us. That's the new culture. 
The old was judgment or wrath. The new culture is love and grace. And I truly believe that the best time to bring love and grace is when you're in disagreement with another person. Because what it does is it doesn't prove you to be a nice person. It, prove, it brings in a spiritual principle and atmosphere that shifts something that the enemy's trying to get a hold of in disagreement. But when we bring in honor above it, and it's tough, but you can practice it and get there. We need to bring this new culture. So the first step for you might be inside of you to start shifting you. And how do you shift you? You get the Word of God that talks about the new culture and you plant it inside you. You plant it inside you. You plant it inside you as a seed. You, you find the scriptures about love. You find the scriptures about grace. You find those and get them in you. And as you get them in you, they become part of you. They become food. They grow. And then the culture in you changes. And then what starts to come out of you is love and grace, not judgment and opinion and, and separation. That's the Old Testament separation. New Testament Love and inclusion. Old Testament, someone who's sick, like a leper, you stay away from them. That was the law. New Testament, <laughs> leper, you get to them because what's on you gets on them. Old Testament, what's on them gets on you. New Testament, new culture, <laughs> what's on us gets on them. We need to start carrying that inside. We have it. We can change nations and we can shift nations. I'd like you to stand up, please.